Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good day and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Leon Tabak. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Our topic is the unbundling of education. And let me read you some titles that prompted me to suggest this, uh, this topic to our producers. I saw an article called The Great Unbundling of Higher Education Starts Now, Exploiting the Unbundling of Education, The Great Unbundling of Workforce Development, The Case for uh, Unbundling Higher Education. And these came from Forbes Magazine, the Brookings Institution, Inside Higher Education, a kind of trade journal for colleges and universities and professors and so on. So we're seeing a great deal of change this year uh, during the pandemic. Many students now studying at home, many teachers learning to teach in new ways. Uh, many students finding that opportunities on campus available to them in previous years are not available. And we think this, uh, these changes might be accelerating um, developments that were already underway. We're wondering what permanent changes will happen in the world of higher education. Okay, so enough introduction. I have three guests to help us explore this topic, and they are all people well known to me, as it so happens. We are all uh, working at Cornell College. I teach computer science there. And my first guest is uh, David Zobner. Uh, David uh, is teaching with me in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, has recently been working in Boston. He is a veteran of a startup institute, a kind of coding boot camp, and has been studying computer science at the graduate level, recently got a, an advanced degree, and had some special interest in that study in how to teach in pedagogy. David, say a few more words to fill in the gaps there that I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do there. I'd say the, the big things are that the Startup Institute was a, uh, a program very much focused on placing people in startup jobs in the Boston and New York area. Um, and that, that part of its, a big part of its success was being very deeply enmeshed in the, the startup community in those areas. Um, and after doing that program, I actually spent uh, six years at a company called Casina, where I was actually, I helped start the company. Um, it was a really very special experience um, and not the kind of thing, sadly, that I think most universities are able to kind of um, help you get your foot in the door of. Okay. So David has an inside look at uh, both higher education and as a younger person knows what challenges his peers are facing in the employment markets today. Uh, Jen Rouse uh, uh, works in our uh, college's library and directs our Center for Teaching and Learning. Jen, um, many of our members of our audience might not know what a Center for Teaching and Learning is. Uh, I think every college now has one. So why don't you explain a little bit about your role here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Leon, and I'm delighted to be with, with my colleagues. Um, the CTL at Cornell is really special, I think, in a lot of ways, and that is is that we all work together in a variety of, of, of ways to promote teaching and learning. So we have an academic technology studio, a writing studio, and a quantitative reasoning studio, and um, professional consultants and peer consultants in all of those areas, as well as consulting librarians. So our primary goal really is to kind of work with faculty from the beginning with goals, um, learning outcomes, assignment design, and then we also go into the classrooms to work with students, co-teach with our peers, and then offer um, individual appointments in the studios for, for our students. So we have a great time. So I think it's, it's fair to say, Jen, that you are helping me and, and my colleagues on the faculty identify the tools we need to teach in a new environment, and you're helping us learn to use those tools. And you're bringing us together to learn from one another and from one another's experiences. Is that a, a fair Absolutely. way? Absolutely. We have definitely had you know a wonderful summer creating that kind of community under duress, but still moving forward in that way. But <laughs> yeah, great. And then Jody Schaefer directs our career office at Cornell College and puts together a, a, a number of wonderful programs. I've, I've had the great pleasure of, of traveling with her on some of her 
career exploration trips with uh, students, meeting prospective employers, introducing students to prospective employers. And she has other experience uh, at the University of Iowa School of Business and in, in industry in and in a human resources office, I think. Is that right, Jody? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, th thanks, Leon. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I started my career in business and then I, uh, I did my MBA and I actually moved into the MBA program at the University of Iowa to work there in recruiting and, and admissions. Uh, managed the program for about a year at the end of my time there, and then moved into human resource management. So I got to see things from the employer side, uh, hired a lot of um, graduates, as well as mid-level to senior level professionals. So really saw firsthand what employers are looking for in the workforce. And then, you know, got a chance to join Cornell, uh, and I work for the career office there where we run um, leadership development programs. We help coach students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we run a mock trial program that really helps with presentation skills. Um, we, so we have a, ser a series of different programs. And then we also intersect with um, faculty to, for example, in David's um, course that he'll be teaching in a couple of months, uh, make connections between kind of the industry and industry professionals and bringing them into the classroom. So you have, you have a lot of direct contact both with our students and with our faculty. Yes, okay. correct. Okay. All right, let me, uh, let me hold up something in front of the camera here. So I mentioned it was reading uh, that prompted me to suggest this uh, topic. And here's, here's one of the books I saw. I'm trying to get my left and right uh, straight <laughs> here. So it's called College Disrupted, The Great Unbundling of Higher Education. And we see two words in the title, the two keywords, disrupted and unbundling. So let me ask uh, our panel if, uh, if you have any, uh, if you can help us understand what disruption or unbundled might mean uh, when it's applied to higher education in the year 2020. What, what, what's happening that we should pay most attention to? Anybody want to chime in here? I, I might grab the disruption topic. Yep. Um, it's, it's definitely a buzzword in the, the space I just came from, which is right. startups. Um, as a buzzword, I think uh, many people would feel that it's pretty heavily overused. But the idea of disruption is that... Uh, is that there's some inefficiency in the market, something that could be done better, simpler, um, you know, cheaper, uh, or or maybe all of the above, and uh, and that somebody finds that better process and upends the entire market. So so a classic example of this might be Netflix, um, which disrupted the video rental industry. They realized, wow, we can do this through the internet, we can do this through the mail. Um, we can stop charging uh, late fees for people, right? There's all of these different things that we can do to make this more efficient, more enjoyable for people. And they radically changed the way now that we rent and watch movies. Um, so that's, I think, the basic idea behind disruption. Now, Jody, you come from the business world where I, I read somewhere, somebody, some inve prominent investor said, there's only two ways to make money. You can either bundle something or unbundle something. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so what, what can you, do you want to yeah, on I, bundling and unbundling here? What sure. I, I think in, I think in this context, you know, the or origins of this discussion is based on uh, the cost of education. There's long been concern about the cost of education and then uh, the skills that, you know, students are coming out with, to ensure that they're job ready. And so this is not new because of the pandemic. I think the pandemic has uh, accelerated some of the discussion about disruption. Um, and, and really what, what we're talking about is can uh, a student, no matter what their age, can they uh, consume education in a way that is quick and according to their schedule and there's not um, additional things that they're doing. They're, they're not necessarily going to a four-year institution and consuming the bundle, which is, right. uh, you know, athletics and career and academics and um, room and board and all of those things in one. And so that, that to me is where the basis of this discussion is coming from. And certainly, you know, I think we all, all of us as panelists have, um, have different feelings on that probably, 
Uh, I don't know if you want to get into that discussion yet, Leon, or not. But yeah, just to whatever you like. What that what that means to me. That's that's I think where this is coming from. Jen, what feels most different for you this this year? What are what are your biggest challenges? Uh, I think the constant state of disruption and reaction. Right. So we have people who are always in it, you know, students and faculty and and staff who are always kind of in that constant cycle of feeling the disruption and thinking there must be some sort of reaction. And so we've seen education kind of come under the lens. In the spring, that moved really quickly, right? We were fueled, we were fired, we had to change. And so we just went for it. And then over the summer, we, you know, we kind of continued in that vein with, you know, social unrest, um, you know, natural disasters that keep coming at us, you know, everywhere in the United States, so much going on. And so we've really had to start thinking about education as something that needs to be transparent and intentional and purposeful in our choices, you know, in our, in constructing our learning outcomes, making those clear to students, really, really working with tools that we know, and then introducing tools that, um, that kind of leverage us in a way that students can can move forward and create community with us. And, and I think that's really key in all of this is, is keeping and maintaining a sense of community. Mm -hmm. I know that's been really, really important to Cornell students, especially. Right, because the students come to a college to learn from one another, not just from their, from their professors. And if they're at home, that becomes a challenge. Um, Let's talk about one of the changes that was uh, uh, strongly embraced by higher education before this uh, difficult year, but is, is gaining even wider adoption now. Um, I'm uh, preparing lectures on video. I record those lectures. I post those lectures on the internet. And this means my students have the opportunity to see my presentations at any time they like and to view them more than once and to come to class then prepared in a way they were not, and I have a freedom to use my meetings with my students in a different way than I did before. Anybody wanna talk about that kind of change in the style of teaching, how it was already there and it's now being accelerated? Absolutely, you know, that's called a flipped classroom and that's been around for quite a while, right? So online education has a long history ever before it hits an institution like Cornell where we're learning to embrace things that have been around for a long time. Um, and I think really moving away from um, some of those um, models of, I think Leon, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, the hour long lecture, you know, right. do we still do that in the, in this era? And I think there are ways that we can. I also think that there are ways that, that we can do exactly what you're doing and is provide that information in advance, use our technology tools to let students comment, ask questions along the way, take small quizzes, engage with the material effectively, and, and really see those kind of take on a new and interesting life of their own that they haven't in the past. Well, and when you think about what happens in the marketplace, that's exactly what's expected of you when you go out into the work world. You're expected to prepare before you come to a meeting so that you can have a productive discussion. So, you know, this is one example of, you know, how now uh, much of higher ed is being forced to do some of these things that did already exist, as Jen mentioned, but it is uh, reminiscent of what's going on in the marketplace. One thing I'll say, though, about the, the flipped classroom is that in my experience as a student fairly recently, um, you, it, it tends not to work very well to simply directly translate what an in-person lecture would be into a flipped classroom. Um, so I, I've taken a couple of flipped classroom classes in the last year, um, and one of them essentially just took the normal class that had been recorded the year before and it was put online and we met to work on homework effectively. And it, it seemed like a really good idea until you realize that what this required of me as a student and of other students was to sit down and watch a two hour long lecture, um, which even at one and a half, 1.75 speed is um, uh, yawn inducing to say the least. Like the most fascinating speaker, if you're watching them on video, it's really, really difficult to maintain focus and awareness of what's happening in a way that um, isn't as true in the classroom. In the classroom, there's a lot of like social expectations and social pushes that keep you focused. 
in a way that's much, much harder if you're sitting at a desk or, or lying in bed while trying to watch these. Um, and so when you make that switch to a flipped classroom, I had another class where none of the videos were longer than 15 minutes, and that was a much more effective um, technique. But it also meant that you just, you, if you already had lectures, they had to be completely and totally re structured to fit into 15 minute blocks that students can actually focus through, if that makes sense. Right, we call that chunking, such a lovely term, chunking. <laughs> um, but, but you're right, right? It keeps your attention span, it engages you a little bit more. If you can think about what each of those chunks is doing in terms of learning outcomes, you know, you're better off um, kind of driving that educational practice from there. Those pedagogical practices really work better if the outcome is, is readily available to you and, and to your students. Again, going back to that, that transparency. So we really want students to engage in that in that way and maybe not just sit and listen for, for hours yeah, on we'll, it, for sure. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk about that. Um, so we, our students, I, I believe, I'm telling my students, they need to be more active, they need to put together their own plan. I mean, this is the message, Jody, and you and I have been telling students forever, <laughs> that they've got to get on top of it. This is not a cruise, you know? That's a one minute, a bundled vacation is a cruise. You pay one price <laughs> and somebody takes care of the entertainment and the food and everything else, right? And, and you, you follow their route. We're making it, we're, our students have to make their own plans more, take more responsibility. I struggle in my teaching this year because when I had students in the classroom, if I had quiet students, I could see something on their face. And the more active students could carry the discussions along a little bit. Now I have students out in, uh, you know, the, the far away, out through the internet. And if they're quiet, I can't tell what's happening. And I'm, I'm still struggling to learn how to bring them into the conversation, make them more active. Anybody else want to talk about this need for the students to, to change their habits and attitudes too to make the best of this? Well, I'd, I'd say that that's an even bigger issue actually in this increasing movement to have uh, fully asynchronous online learning, right? So the student who's going to be quiet and possibly get lost in a, a synchronous Zoom class like we're doing a lot of at Cornell right now is uh, they may never make it through the first hour of a class on Coursera, right? Which is entirely at your own pace, entirely self-driven, um, there's no kind of uh, social or emotional dynamic to it in terms of you having a relationship with whoever's in theory teaching it. Um, so it's, uh, I think part of the issue with this unbundling is that there's a lot of value in the one-on-one -on -one relationships that happen at colleges and universities. And um, it's very, very hard to replicate that or replace that in, um, in a lot of these unbundled and online environments. Jody, uh, before you joined us, our career office was hidden on campus. Students really had to search for it. And then we put you in an office that's close to the food line. They, they want to eat, they can't, <laughs> they can't uh, avoid noticing that we're trying to help them get a job after they leave us. What are you doing to reach out to students now that you know, some students aren't physically present? Yeah, so so we are still, you know, we do a lot of marketing to students. We're we're emailing them constantly. We are uh, scheduling one on one meetings with students. Um, we're going into classrooms. So, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from, Leon. I was just in a classroom, a senior seminar, and it was hard to get students talking. You know, so we had to to use the breakout rooms and we gave an assignment, uh, you know, over Zoom. Um, but even that wasn't ideal. You know, it's hard to move in between uh, breakout rooms and Zoom as well. So you, we what, what we're trying to do is kind of the combination of both. You know, we're, we're trying to have those one on one conversations. We can do that um, via Zoom, but we can also do it in person, uh, socially distanced, of course. But then, you know, also go into classrooms at the same time and do it both ways. So, you know, there's there's no um, I don't think there's one silver bullet uh, for education. I think you have to be doing multiple things to engage the student. And so that's what we try to do as well. We're also you know, we're hosting our first ever virtual career fair uh, right. next week. And, and we've seen some great success there already because employers don't have to travel. So guess what? We have more employers than 
than we would have ever had on campus. So there's some real benefits to what's happening right now as well. Um, I mean, there there is icing on the cake at times, although there's a lot of negative. There's there's also some positives for for what's happening in education. Jan, I, I want to give you a question here now. Uh, David mentioned Coursera. That's a that's an mm -hmm. online provider of courses, especially in computer science. It was sure. a pioneer in this field. I visited the offices in Silicon Valley of one of their competitors, and the thing that most impressed me was at my college. The college asked me to teach a course, and I am responsible for that whole course. I design the course, I compose the presentations, mm -hmm. I decide how students will be evaluated, and so on. Now, when a company like that, every course is a team effort, mm -hmm. and they're people who specialize. There's somebody who's good at presentation, somebody who's good at the design of the course, somebody who's good at technology. And I'm wondering if that's one of the kinds of unbundling we're going to see, where we have more teamwork for the development of courses. Mm -hmm. You are one of my teammates because <laughs> you pick up, you help me with things. I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. So to comment on that idea of, of a different model of distributing the work. Um, well, I think we already are seeing a little bit of that, just what you said, Leanne, right? Like I, I saw more of my peers this summer than I ever had in the past because we really needed to think about delivering new models of education that play to our strengths, right? So each college really does need to consider what its students come to for that added value, right? And Cornell is, as David pointed out, that kind of um, mix of synchronous experience with some of that that those social activities. So our students really, really kind of stepped in and said, we don't really want the Coursera model necessarily, but we still want, you know, to be engaged and and part of the process. So I think you know a lot of this is about engaging students in conversations about what a good class is to them, right, and making small reflective changes. Okay, so we may not be experts in each one of the pieces that we think that our courses should have, but I would say to you, Leon, what's one thing that you want to change over the next few blocks? You know, let's try that. I don't want you to try three new technologies, you know, um, and all kinds of things on top of that. I want to, I want you to think about here's one here's one soft skill that I want my students to take away from this course. And is there a technology that can help me do this? Is there a way that I can get students to work together to help me do this? Those kinds of things. And then we bring those back together, right, in our conversations about teaching and we say, hey, what worked for you? How did that go? What would you do differently? Um, so maybe not so much specialized, but most certainly, again, community building, making that team and having that reflective practice in place is, is crucial for us. Do you feel like your role is is evolving rapidly now? Or, or? You know, I think it's really just coming into what I always wanted to do, about. right? And what I was really looking forward to. And that is, is as soon as we put up the lens and maybe a little bit of that burning lens of the, you know, <laughs> on there and say, hey, we really have to change. We really have to move forward. What does that mean to us? And so, you know, I've had that, I've had many more, I think, valuable interactions with, with my colleagues since this has started. Well, I hope I hope my colleagues and I are making you feel more appreciated. Ah, I, absolutely. I would, say to, I, would, <laughs> I would say to the students in the, in the audience or to their parents that this unbundling means students have to take more responsibility for themselves. And that means they have to find the resources and make use of all the resources. Absolutely. And they, they should not overlook the kind of resources that uh, Jen Rouse provides in the Center for Teaching and Learning. So professors aren't the, aren't the, the, whole, the whole game at, uh, at, at colleges. There are lots of people there to help you Absolutely. on your own. So we've got, uh, we've got our director of, uh, of, of the career office. We've got the Center for Teaching and Learning with many components, helping students and professors in many ways. All right, um, we're coming so uh, close to our end. We've got uh, sort of five or six minutes left. Are there some points that you brought to the conversation that you were thinking about before we started that you'd like to include here? Well, actually, I, I have a question for you, Leon, having read yeah. the books about the unbundling. Um, it doesn't really seem like the unbundling is happening, right? At every year in the news, we see that universities and colleges are getting more expensive. They're offering even more services. The bundles are getting bigger and more complex. Um, schools like Northeastern include now in their bundle arranging for you to have two and sometimes even three different 
uh, six month long work experiences that are part of your college experience. Um, more and more schools are even bundling in the master's program, right? Stay on one more year and we'll give you a master's in this or that or the third thing. Um, You've read the books. Do you really think the unbundling is coming? Well, because... I, I, I picked up a book with the title Unbundling, and I found less unbundling than I than I hoped to find. <laughs> One of the big ideas I found was he put a lot of emphasis on the fact that a very large fraction of the American college students are not enrolled in colleges like ours. They're not trying to complete a bachelor's degree in four years of full-time study between the ages of 18 and 22. And so he's calling for the system the, the whole collection of American colleges and universities to do a better job of serving those students who have responsibilities to families, to employment, who are interrupting their education with work, who are uh, moving between institutions. He's frustrated by the lack of standardization. Uh, students go in this way, lose credits when they move from one institution to another and so on, okay, all right. Okay, and another point, and maybe uh, Jody can uh, jump in here. Uh, another idea the author, Ryan Craig, pointed out is he put a lot of emphasis on what he called the double click transcript. Have you heard this term, uh, Jody? Yeah, I heard it when you introduced it a few days ago. <laughs> uh, <okay>. Well, <laughs> but, the, notion is, the notion is that we professors are being asked to state our, our learning objectives up front. Mm -hmm. uh, the old way of, of designing a course was I'll, I'll talk about something, and then at the end of the course, I'll figure out how I'm going to grade them. Now the idea is we want a more explicit set of goals, often in collaboration with employers who will help us establish those. Right, and I think I think a lot of uh, faculty have been doing that. You know, I think it's expected now, and I think that's a good thing. It, it right. should be there should be some tie to the expectations of industry as well, in addition to what's always worked in education. Yeah, and the good news for us is that uh, the demands from employers are are the kinds of things that we emphasize at, at our kind of college, the ability to present yourself, to stand up confidently, to learn on your own, and, and so on. Okay, we're down to our last few minutes, so I want to give each person sort of 30 seconds or something, uh, uh, a message to the audience, something you want to want them to walk away with uh, today. Anybody got something in I, mind? David. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start. Um, I'll just say that uh, these days, one of the things that I'm seeing in the world, especially having been, gone through a boot camp, is that people no longer have one career, and they right. probably aren't going to have two or three. Um, okay. I think the future is people having five or six careers throughout their lifetime. So more than ever, I think what you really are going to want out of college is that ability to learn new things and, and to focus elsewhere. Jody, 20 seconds. I would also say that the bundled approach works very well for, for a good fraction of students right, just because right. they don't know what they want to do. So to David's point, it's a dis time of discovery and to have all those options available is what allows students to discover. So I, I see it working very well for many students. And Jen, you got uh, 30 seconds here. I think I would like to just kind of end with, you know, it's okay to take a breath. It's okay to reflect. It's okay to lead with compassion, and it's okay to listen to your students and and to have you know these kinds of conversations in your classrooms. and And we're going to keep moving forward, but I think we're going to do it in a in a more profound way than we ever have. Very good. So thank you all for joining us on this episode of Ethical Perspectives on the News. Thank you to my guests, David, Jen, and Jody, and I hope you'll join us again next time on another episode of Ethical Perspectives on the News. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.